morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, this week's edition of the Director's Roundtable. Um, as always, we will talk about whatever you want to talk about. We were, we're going to kick this off with some conversation around reopening, and I've invited Rick Hall from Texas A&M and Greta, Greta, tell me how to say your last name, Geese, is yeah. it? Great. Uh, from Northern Iowa Community College, as well as Chris Dennison from University of Northern Iowa. Um, both Rick and Greta opened their rec centers yesterday. So we're going to kick off with um, some comments from them about how that went, um, any early lessons learned, um, any, any words of wisdom they want to share with their colleagues here. And then um, Chris is going to help me facilitate, share some things that are going on in Iowa. He's also, um, through his work, has contacts uh, in military bases in Europe and Asia. And some of those countries, of course, are ahead of us in the reopening scenario. And so he'll share a couple things he's learned from his colleagues there. So Greta, why don't I start with you um, and tell us about what happened, what happened yesterday? How'd it go? Well, we are literally open right now. I have my window overlooks our facility. And so um, we are open um, as of yesterday during some shortened hours. We decided to do peak hours including an early morning segment from five to eight. And then again, over the lunch hour from 11 to one. So people are just actually coming through and waving at me through my window. So I'll try to not ignore them, but ignore them as I speak. Um, and then we are open again in the afternoon and early evening from four to seven uh, during weekdays. And so we decided to do that so that in between those times, our custodial team and student workers could disinfect and clean all of the equipment, and we could try to manage some of our supplies. So uh, we, yes, day one yesterday, and as I've been telling people, I almost don't want to talk about it because it's like talking about a no-hitter. You don't do that, but I'm cautiously optimistic. We weren't overwhelmed. We had probably, I would say, 40% of our capacity on a Monday in May at this time. Um, our summer semester has not begun yet, so we didn't have any of our normal on-campus students or anything like that, uh, which was good. A soft opening is good. Um, and then we honestly had really very little negativity. It was very pleasant, very respectful. Uh, I, we didn't have any issues with people being close to one another, with anyone not cleaning equipment, it was, I, I don't even want to say that out loud to all of you today, but it was very uneventful, um, even though we were geared up for it to be eventful. So all is well. Um, our institution, we're a community college in rural Northwest Iowa, and so our summer semester does begin on Wednesday. Uh, mm -hmm. Students are returning to campus today, those that are going to um, live on campus for the summer because we do have a lot of hands-on programming at our community college that can't continue exclusively online. Uh, so we're probably unique to many of you in that regard. We're going to be some of the people who are the guinea pigs for what it means to bring students back on campus. Uh, you cannot uh, learn how to service a diesel engine online. That doesn't work very well. So we have about 200 students that will be on campus. So while yesterday was our first day, I don't think it's our true test. Um, but yeah, I would say one thing that has surprised me since we uh, made our announcement on how we were reopening and exactly what policies, procedures, and hours we would be following, which was last week, Thursday, when our entire campus sent out our press release outlining the summer semester and plans. One thing that has surprised me is the response that I'm getting from community members about caring for their elderly parents and that mm -hmm. they appreciate us being open, but they won't be returning right away. So um, somebody says get specific with protocols. I don't know how specific or how much time you want me to take. No, go for it. Go ahead and answer that question. And then Rick and, and Chris can incorporate what they're thinking about as well. Okay. So beyond our hours, um, we are only allowing members. Uh, we do sell community members um, to our facility as well as facilitate on campus uh, students, faculty, and staff. So student members, faculty, and staff members, and then community members can come back. We also sell guest passes. So somebody could come in 
for $5 and exercise just for the day. We are not allowing those at this time, so no guest passes. We are limiting capacity in our areas. So we have a fitness studio that actually opens up to our larger facility and we've opened that wall up and we um, are allowing 10 people to exercise in that area. We set uh, 10 or fewer parameters in our cardio areas, our weight room areas, our track, and then we actually took and moved equipment onto our basketball courts. Our courts are closed for basketball, tennis, volleyball, etc. We moved weight and cardio equipment onto the courts to spread everything out further. Um, we have one staff member at the front desk at a time, one custodial staffer here, and then myself, so limited staff. We're not doing group fitness. We're not doing personal training. Um, we have closed our locker rooms and showers. We only have one, our more spacious restroom, but the restroom that doesn't include any showers or locker room space. Um, so we only have that available to people. Um, we're not doing towel service. Water bottle filling stations are open, but not our uh, water fountains or drinking fountains. We're screening our members with a sign at the door. If they come in with their membership card and scan their card, that is their indication that they have said no to the COVID-19 screening questions that are posted on our front door. My staff has plexiglass that's been installed at our front desk. We usually have a very open air front desk area, but we've installed plexiglass with an opening for staff members to take temperature literally right inside the front door. Um, so we screen for temperature. Um, we haven't had anybody have any concerns. Um, we have not, I'm seeing questions as they come in. Haley, we're not rotating a schedule with staff. Uh, I have a team of 34 employees um, for student employees and not all of them are available because not all of them are back to campus. So we're doing the best we can with what we have. Um, and I do have a couple of full-time staff that are participating in that schedule. No, no one under the age of 18 is allowed without the direct supervision of their own parent or guardian. Uh, and that coupled with not having the basketball courts online has helped us not become a gathering point for the younger kids and the students that are not in class. Uh, what else? Um, about masks and gloves? We are, as a campus, we are highly encouraging masks and gloves for employees across campus, but I was not allowed to require masks or gloves. Mm -hmm. All of my staff is provided that, so we have plenty of masks for each person to have two masks, actually, um, and their cloths, so uh, we have laundry facilities here that we can wash them and make sure that they're appropriately cleaned. Um, some of my staff have chosen to do that and some have not. Uh, those that are sitting behind the plexiglass and stationed at that space don't seem to be doing the mask. I will say that that does make it very hard to hear with a layer of plexiglass and then wearing a mask. I haven't had very many exercisers wearing masks. Again, we're highly encouraging our patrons to wear a mask if they feel comfortable doing so while exercising but we're not requiring it. Um, and what else? I, I could go on for hours, I feel like. Yeah, so let's, uh, no, me, we'll, we'll field some more questions. Time. Yeah, we'll field some more questions in a minute. I wanna turn it over to Rick. And Rick, you also opened yesterday. So how'd it go at Texas A&M? Good morning, everyone, except those of you on the East Coast. So I guess good mm -hmm. afternoon to you. Uh, we opened yesterday and it, it went really well. We were prepared to open. Uh, the governor closed all gyms in the state of Texas. I think it was like March 17th. About mid-April, he was making announcements and he was really about to make announcements to open all those things that happened. He was going to make that announcement to be effective for May 4th. So we were planning and we thought he was going to open gyms on May, May 4th. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, he didn't, but we started doing all that planning. So in April, when I was putting together this plan that vice president wanted, 
So we really had so much of the heavy lifting already done when we got to May 4th, and he didn't allow gyms to open. In fact, it was later on to May 18th. So the, the types of things that I was sending to uh, the vice president, the president of the university is that we were going to run modified schedules, open about four or five hours in the morning and in the evening. We will be closed about two hours mid-afternoon and all the student employees uh, and custodial would be helping to disinfect all touch points throughout the facility. Uh, and of course, at the end of the night as well. We bought about 500 face masks for all of our student employees. They are required to wear those. We launder all of those for them and uh, use our you know, commercial washers and all that good stuff. We also bought those sneeze guard plexiglass. We probably, seems like they're all over the place, but they're at every customer service point. So we have two at our member service desk. We have two people, uh, two students, one student, one full-time member services. Many of you know Evelyn. We can't get her to leave the building. But anyway, their equipment, et cetera, our climbing wall people, strength and conditioning. So we have those as well. Um, any student that wants to wear their own mask, they can. and. Uh, that gets a little loose there. We, you know, it's up to them to wash and launder their own masks. So that's why we're providing those and offering those. We also uh, provided them for all of our full-time staff. I cannot, we, can, we cannot require our staff to wear a mask, full-time staff. Student staff, we can, unless their position description requires it. So the vice president had this position and I do the same thing. Strongly encouraged out of respect for your fellow staff person because you may not have any fear of this, they may. So if I'm here in my office, I don't have a mask on unless somebody comes in to visit. But if I'm walking through the hallways or any common spaces, obviously we do. Uh, so that was a lot of what we were doing for um, providing our student staff with those things. Of course, we put little footprints on the floor, those little kind that adhere to the floor, the six foot intervals. We divided our entrance. We did all the, you know, theater rope stuff so that, you know, for our big, you know, people come and go either side. We started, you know, guiding people in on one side and exiting on the other. We have about six turnstiles or in the past, we've allowed people to come and go through any. We haven't, you know, for, for, forced people. We changed that to where there's three in and two out and one closed. So we're, we're doing that, got the little footprints up. In our strength and conditioning room, the governor allowed 25%. We have a 30,000 square foot strength and conditioning room that capacity is over 600. But our president and the provost wanted us to start off with 50. So what we've used, using IM leads, people have to sign up online. And so today at noon, signups will begin for tomorrow. People have 50 minutes to work out. We have those slots throughout the day. So yesterday we went 10 to two and then five to nine. All those slots fill up usually within a couple of hours and then we start a waiting list that could be about 50 people. We've had to institute some, I don't wanna use the word penalties, but there's some conditions. If you reserve a spot and fail to show, and that's bad if you've you know taken that spot. You can't use the strength and conditioning sign up system for one day afterwards. If you fail to show twice, you can't use that strength and conditioning room for a week and and on and all up to two week periods. So if they if they know something comes up and they can't make it, they can come in and cancel and then a, a person waiting in line, the wait list will get plugged in. So we know things come up, but just, you know, people that 
ah, I don't want to go work out. So we've closed off every other piece of equipment, all the cardio, you know, so like if there's 40 treadmills, every other one, selectorized, our big, big free weight area, you know, all the big racks are six foot apart. We took out about, you know, half of the benches in there, the, the ones in front of the dumbbells. We've got footprints all throughout there. And we make announcements every 15 minutes that we do not require gloves and we do not require our students to wear a mask. Um, they can if they want to, but they don't have to. It's, it's, uh, it's been a big debate. It's kind of difficult if you're working out pretty strenuously to breathe. Some people find it difficult to breathe anyway. So we're asking every participant to clean and we've got those wipes and we've got spray uh, disinfectants all over. Every time you finish using your equipment, you spray disinfectant on it. We have more than our normal facility of strength and conditioning staff roaming. Somebody leaves their station, they don't clean it, they will come in and disinfect it for them. So they're just like all over that. Uh, basketball courts, we don't allow any basketball, raise the basket. We put the volleyball standards up or and or raised them in the ceiling. Indoor soccer goals have been moved. Um, you can play singles badminton and singles pickleball. Racquetball, one person. So if you want to go in there and work on your back end, you can do that. Uh, we do allow table tennis, and there's table tennis uh, tables in the uh, in the racquetball courts. The pool will probably open tomorrow. There was a big disconnect in the state of Texas, and those Texans on the call will know what I'm talking about. The governor says you can open pools. American Red Cross didn't want to move from their position, and they have the requirements for the guards, right? That, you know, what if their certification expired during that time? Well, there were some extensions for that, but they weren't budging on the in-service requirements of once a month, and then what about working on rescues, backboarding, and all those things? Even though the, the governor and everybody says, if you need to go make a rescue, you can ignore social distancing, go save a person. So wasn't a problem there, it's how do you practice it and do in-services? Finally, different people all over the state, somebody from the governor's office and, and our, pre, our vice president agreed, the governor trumps American Red Cross open the pools. So we didn't open yesterday, but after doing a lot of hard work, we had told staff that uh, we had opened next Monday, but we'll probably open tomorrow the next day. Jogging track is open. And we, you know, think of all the intramural officials that haven't been able to work for a couple of months now, and anybody else that isn't, we're using those student employees throughout the building as sort of like, I don't want to use the word monitors, but they help remind people of the social distancing. Because you can imagine on a track, some people like to walk together and, and or jog together. So we're just reminding that we got cardio equipment on the second and third floors. You know, we have a monitor going around there. Of course, every other piece is closed off, but that's to remind them to clean. And if they don't, this, this person cleans it for them. So, uh, bouldering is open. We've limited different places of bouldering. We've allowed indoor climbing and we're using the auto belay features. So we're trying to get a lot of things back out there for the students. They've responded well. They've been tickled to death. And uh, we're crossing our finger that today goes as well as yesterday. Questions? Yeah, let's see, Rick, it sounds like you, you saw the question about the climbing wall. Thanks for that. There was a, another question, uh, Rick, that both you and Greta could respond to about emergencies. So Kim, I think that was your question. Do you wanna say a little bit more about, are you thinking about emergencies in general or specific types of emergencies and, and the planning for that? Yeah, I think it has more to do uh, in general. And thanks, Rick, for already saying, um, sort of speaking to lifeguards. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that really helped. Um, 
you know, part of it for us is uh, approximately one third of our student staff um, are trained as professional rescuers and um, duty of care. And so we're trying to get an answer from our general counsel and they're trying, they're asking us to find out what our colleagues are doing. They really don't want to give us an answer um, about what our duty of care is. And I was just curious more, you know, um, unfortunately we have enough emergencies in the facility and I just, you know, that's always been top of mind for me. Well, and, you, and you're right. We sent all these procedures to uh, university council. We sent them the whole debate between American Red Cross and, you know, in the state of governor. And you're right, attorneys don't want to make a decision. They want to refer to previous decisions in cases and all. But at this point, kind of like with the golf course, they supported us. The day before we opened, we had the, uh, the vice president, associate vice president for environmental health and safety and the director of environmental health and safety over here for a tour. We showed them all of that. Of course, we'd been cleaning like crazy. We brought in a couple of professional commercial disinfectant specialists, but we'd been closed for two months. And I, I'm no doctor or scientist, but I don't think the virus was supposed to stay alive, but the strength and conditioning team, those that know Jared Wilson, I mean, he's about AR as anybody, and they just, that place was a clean you could eat off of. But to get back to the emergency, you know, we provide a medic on duty anytime, an EMT anytime the building's open. So they're here, they're staff, they have PPE, but again, they have permission and will do whatever's necessary to, to save, save somebody if it came to that. And then, uh, you know, with the guards and all, I think they're working through some of the drills, CPR, we were saying, hey, why not use two mannequins? And this one's for ventilations, this one's compressions. So try to simulate as much as you could. Test your students out, make sure they still have the skills. The, the challenge is uh, testing with a struggling victim, you know, a passive victim and all that stuff. So I don't know if I answered your question, hopefully. You did, thanks so much, Rick. And Kim, I think the we don't have a pool in, in our facility. The uh, pool in our community falls under our city rec department. Um, so we're still navigating that and pools are not open in Iowa and we're still awaiting parameters and guidance um, for that. Uh, so our emergency response would just be a standard first aid, CPR, you know, first responder type response. And we do on our campus have an emergency response team. So with a nursing department and an emergency services department, uh, we have a great resources there that we can ask them to respond. Of course, we're right there, so we would respond. But if we are doing gloves and you know we'd have our airway masks, um, if we would have it, you would follow all of those precautions anyway in a first aid or emergency response because of the unknown uh, situation with a member or a guest. So I guess to me, the first response, as long as you already have all of those uh, PPE and pre precautions in place, you, there's not that much that has to change. As, as a former lifeguard, you already, you know, make sure that you aren't coming in direct contact with bodily fluids, bloodborne pathogens. Sure. You do that anyway. Yeah. So that's, that would be my response to your Thank question, Kim. And I, I throw this out too, if I can, those of you in the swimming aquatics community, you know, there's mandates that, you know, for pools that you have a bathhouse and locker room and all this. The governor said all the locker rooms would be closed. So we put up temporary doors, plywood doors. So the locker rooms are off limits. Um, for those that want to shower, we're lucky to have showers on deck. They were put there purposely for the dive team. So I think you can have people go through there as they've finished their swimming to rinse off and or go under the showers before they get in. But then they're going into a bathroom to, to change clothes. So faculty and staff that are like avid swimmers, 
they're going to have to figure that out in a in a bathroom because there's no locker rooms available. Okay, um, there's a lot of good uh, questions about waivers and a bit of risk management in the chat. Um, I wanna let everyone know, and Aaron will put the link in the chat. Um, we're gonna host a round table with our friends at Ermia, the University Risk Managers Association. I think it's scheduled for next week. We'll have some rec professionals and university rec man uh, risk managers on the call from, um, I believe, Virginia Tech and and I'll remember the other school, um, to kind of share that perspective so that recreation can share with the risk managers in the audience, you know, some of your unique challenges and situations with the types of programs and facilities that you run, and also for rec professionals to hear from the university risk managers how they're approaching some things. Like you're saying, obviously, there's a lot of state and local guidelines that will affect this, but I, th I think it'll still be helpful for both parts of the profession, both the risk managers and rec professionals to exchange some ideas and see how each other is, is approaching all of this. Um, Elon, thank you, Aaron. Um, uh, I wanted to pivot to, and, and we'll get to Chris in just a minute, uh, but this, you're having great discussion and great questions, so I don't want to interrupt that. Um, Tina, you asked a question about, does anyone have a plan for if and when they get their first case, case of COVID? Does anyone want to chime in? Have you thought about that? Um, um, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, we actually kind of, I kind of, people have been reading in the chat with kind of did happen to us. We did not have a staff member test positive, but it directly affected one of our staff members who was in contact with somebody else who, who tested positive and it caused mandatory, mandatory quarantine, 14 day quarantine of essential employees to opening our facility. So we were planning on opening on Monday. And this happened on Friday, last Friday. So we had to rethink everything. And everybody who was in contact is on the 14 day quarantine. Um, and that's provided by our governor's orders. So that was what was decided. So now our incident command team is looking at putting all staff on rotating schedules, having um, in, in every department, not just the rec center, but in every department where um, so that if there is an infection of a staff member, um, employees, not all employees have to go into that quarantine. And Haley, remind everyone what school you're at. Um, Northwest College in Wyoming. So we are much okay. smaller. Um, we are much smaller um, and we can operate at a smaller capacity because we don't have as many students. So I know that some of this may not be manageable at all for the larger universities. Yeah, but I think that's a good point, right? You were ready to open on, on Monday and then Friday had a, had a test, uh, a case that impacted your staff. And it sounds like the contract contact tracing went pretty well pretty quickly you're able to isolate this and then take the right quarantine measures um kevin george do you want to say a little bit more about how your university is managing the contact tracing element yeah i just think that um right now we are not planning on opening until july or august and uh, right now we're really looking forward to <laughs> learning from all the reopening of gyms public gyms and community centers as well as campus rec but uh i think during this time we've had a lot of volunteering on helping with retention initiatives and other things and then in order for us to be i guess um you know viable throughout this time um, we've also have a good relationship with the wellness center and the director of the wellness center is looking for 25 contact tracers so uh, we're soliciting um, people in student affairs to be those individuals so um, every i believe the plan is every student that's going to be on campus will have to opt in they're looking at an app that would kind of keep a hold of where they're going on campus. And then if there is a case, then we would have a contact tracer um, kind of work with that individual to see where they've been and who they've been in contact with. And they're just gonna continue to spread out who they've been in contact with just to kind of minimize that. And obviously we're gonna be quarantining that individual. Um, but that's just something that um, those that have capacity on our staff have already, a couple of them have already volunteered to, to have be, be a part of that initiative. There will be obviously a, a training involved and some privacy concerns and issues, um, but that's just something that uh, in order for us to have in-person um, opportunities on campus, it's a mandate through our state. And Kevin, is that available for student staff or professional staff or both? 
I think it's limiting for professional staff based on the privacy. And um, I believe we'll be fine getting 25 individuals from our um, faculty staff community. Um, I know our medical school is doing the community tracing. Mm -hmm. I know there was a need for our county and I believe our medical school students and faculty are taking that on. But for at the Rowan University uh, campuses, uh, we wanted to have uh, 25 tracers for the 25,000 individuals. Mm -hmm. Anyone else on the call want to chime in on how they're participating or managing contact tracing, if they are? Okay, well, Chris, let me um, pivot to you. Um, and we wanted to talk about how everyone's thinking about special populations today um, that you know, you're used to, to providing services for in your rec center and, and how you're going about thinking about that. So do you wanna kick us off with that topic? Sure. I, uh, as I was reading through the Connect this morning, I saw that, that Lexi had put out a note uh, from the University of Michigan. Um, I, I'm not sure I would say it was a reminder so much of a question of what's everybody else doing about um, our special populations and, and um, how do we uh, make sure that our special populations are getting taken care of in our planning for um, our reopening and, and post reopening. So I, I didn't, didn't go to scroll through the whole thing here. Do we know if Lexi's on the call or someone from University of Michigan? Okay, maybe we should just There's open it up and see if there's somebody here who has uh, done some planning in this particular area for uh, special populations. Okay, well, it sounds like Not since um, <laughs> sounds like that's an area that we all um, certainly need to be checking on while we're uh, going through this process of um, of how we're going to uh, take care of uh, our special populations. So. I'll reach out to Lexi personally and see if she's done some planning in this area, and then maybe we could share that out, Pam. Absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Pam, this is Stephanie from CalBath. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a plan necessarily, but I was just on a call with someone who works at a mega church, and there have been mm -hmm. options, same, same kind of thing, um, elderly and immunocompromised individuals and how to attend church safely when all that happens. And they are talking about a hybrid model. Um, and, and we've talked about this for our group X classes. So you have the amount of people that are allowed in the space, but then you're also live streaming for those people who can't get in the, or shouldn't come in the building. And the other option was for them service times where, you know, the 8 a.m. service time is for the uh, special population. And then you disinfect in between and then you have the next population comes in, whatever it's family or you know, next level members. But that was just a hybrid model that um, that they were talking about that I think can apply, you know, possibly mm -hmm. our situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is anyone considering special hours for vulnerable populations? I mean, we're seeing it all over the grocery stores, obviously. We decided not to do that, but nearby no. uh, a community facility is doing just almost exactly like their grocery store, their morning mm -hmm. two hours are going to be for their older populations and anyone who's immunocompromised mm -hmm. or in a, in a category that needs um, to be there at a certain time and then closing and disinfecting the entire facility and then the other mm -hmm. hours are open. We decided that since we were doing such limited hours, um, and because we were not certain what that would mean, that phase one, we wouldn't incorporate that and we would just do our limited hours. But there certainly are folks out there doing that. Yeah. It one looks like AM has is, a plan. Go ahead, Chris. I'm sorry. One of the concerns that I have is our patrons who um, have respiratory issues, COPD, we may have retirees coming to our facilities that are on oxygen. Uh, specifically respiratory um, ailments like asthma or our patrons with cystic fibrosis specifically where uh, CF patients are actually requested to cough as much as possible to try to clear their lungs. Um, and that particular uh, issue as we're writing up our protocols about if you've been sneezing, coughing, have a fever, you know, that coughing piece right there uh, becomes restrictive for a uh, patron who has cystic fibrosis. So 
Um, I guess I would kind of throw it out as we need to be cautious of that and work with um, work with our special populations in the in the medical area in those areas in respiratory illnesses. Mm -hmm. So, Chris, you had some other thoughts to share about how you're approaching reopening. Let's dive into those now. Sure. Well, my um, for some reason my PowerPoint thing um, is frozen, so I can't get to it. Oh. Right now. So I'll just oh. go off my notes here. So that like, serves you um, right for trying to show us up, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, like many of you guys, uh, we have the incident command uh, system in place. And, and obviously that group for the closing has now rotated back into what we're calling return to UNI. Um, and that group um, includes uh, vice provost and our CIO. Uh, my supervisor, who's the executive director of health and well-being, uh, director of university relations, director of risk, and then our chair of the faculty. That's our steering committee. And there are seven subgroups underneath that um, that are headed up by um, mostly a director and associate director on campus, uh, teaching and learning, research and scholarship, student engagement, <clears throat> excuse me, housing and dining, community engagement and outreach facilities and health and safety. And I've tried, I mean, it's a little bit easier at my size school with 10,000 students um, to be able to specifically put some of my uh, staff into some of these, um, these groups, but we wanna be at the table for these conversations for sure. I know my uh, assistant director of facilities, Luke is on the call right now. So he's gonna be on that facilities one and he serves on the UNI, uh, the UNI facilities planning advisory committee. So. We definitely want to be at the table. The university has identified us and the student union, um, and this is historic too, as uh, kind of the guinea pig. So when we have a new initiative on campus, a new recycling program, a new cleaning product, the university wants to test out. They usually test it on us because we're, you know, high touch. Um, you know, thousands of people in the building every day, uh, so they like to test it out with us. So we were given that request the other day. Uh, of when we could be open and what are the lessons learned that we can learn or what what are the lessons that we can learn from the rec center opening before we have 10,000 students come back in August. Um, so again, we definitely want to be at the table for that. <clears throat> um, would you like me to transition into some of this stuff that I've um, learned from yeah. overseas? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So uh, Pam and I have had a few conversations uh, in the past about uh, my past life, which was uh, putting interns, uh, recreation interns on military installations around the world um, and have about 20 years experience doing that. And so Pam reached out to me and we had a conversation about um, my former students and friends who had literally have our jobs as recreation directors and coordinators on uh, military installations around the world. So I reached out to some of the areas where we know there have been uh, outbreaks or uh, uh, hot spots or how those are being managed and, and what are the lessons learned there. So I reached out specifically uh, to uh, Germany, Italy, Army, or sorry, uh, Korea and, uh, and Japan uh, to our rec directors who are on military installations in those particular areas. So what we're finding uh, with this is in Germany, we're still seeing that the recreation centers on bases are still closed. Uh, in Italy, the rec centers are also closed. Um, however, they are encouraging outdoor recreation activities, which doesn't surprise me so much. Um, the thing that's gonna be interesting for our colleagues on the uh, Italian Navy bases specifically is those are owned by local landowners and we rent the space. And so they also have to abide by not only Navy and Marine Corps regulations, but also the regular or the local um, regulations by the health department of the country of Italy. Mm -hmm. So that's gonna be interesting for them and a little bit more complicated in terms of how they're gonna reopen. Um, in Korea, um, the rec centers on military installations have had a few restrictions that have been open for weeks now. And if you're following the news, you probably noticed that there is another uh, outbreak that's happened in Seoul. Um, it's ironic because that um, di nightclub district is literally a 10 minute walk to the front base of a 30,000 US Army garrison. It's a huge installation. 
uh, that um, is right next to that, uh, that area. So they've basically reduced all of the restrictions for use of the rec center uh, and activities on base except for the swimming pools. Those are still closed. Um, but they're planning on opening the pool on May 21st. Um, I guess the one restriction they still have in, in place is with social distancing is no spotting in the weight room. And other than that, they've pretty much opened up. The Air Force Base, which is located about 40 miles south of Seoul, uh, the outdoor pool is still closed, they have, but they open the bowling alley. <laughs> every, other, every other lane in the bowling alley is open. So they figured that that's gonna be good enough for their social distancing. Intramurals is closed, outdoor equipment is closed, but they have their CPR classes that did not get canceled. So we know that there, it's gonna be difficult for them in terms of their distancing to be able to do that. Uh, they did reopen their group exercise classes as well uh, and trying to social distance with that as well as their personal training is open as well. So, you know, there's some confusion here, I think about what should be open and what shouldn't even within the same base. Um, the, I'll turn to Japan now because this one is really interesting to me. The Naval Flight uh, Installation, which is just south of Tokyo, is called Atsugi. They have closed everything, encouraged jogging and running on base and walking, uh, but they're opening the indoor swimming pool at the Ranger Gym. And by the way, most of these installations have rec centers that look just like ours, just as nice as our rec centers, um, or in some cases, really a lot nicer. Um, but they opened the indoor swimming pool. And the reason for that is they share the base with the Japanese Coast Guard and the Japanese Coast Guard needs to get those rescue swimmers back in the pool and keep their skills up. But the locker rooms are closed. You come in, you lap swim and you leave, bring your own towel. Two stops on the train down from there is a large US Army installation and they've released, they've gotten rid of all of their restrictions. So the Navy base still has most restrictions in place and right down the road, the Army base doesn't. <clears throat> the last thing I checked on was Guam. We know the USS Roosevelt has been stationed there for weeks now and had a massive problem. So the Air Force and the Navy uh, in Guam has also basically shut down all of their MWR facilities. Um, and, and that's for obvious reasons with that outbreak on the USS Roosevelt. So, um, oops, sorry about that. So uh, those are some of the things that I found um, uh, from our colleagues overseas. Um, I did not get any responses to, you know, this was a big thing that we learned or we wish we'd known of this or we should have done this. There was no responses like that. Um, and so I, I think I'll, I'll go back to our example. Uh, even though we're still shut down and, and are hoping to open probably around June 15th, we were able to get our outdoor recreation gear rental program up and running. That was approved through our uh, incident management uh, system. Um, and, um, and that's a crucial rental uh, income item for us during the summer. So we have some pretty heavy protocols we put in place uh, to be able to do that. And we're gonna reopen uh, this coming Thursday for uh, canoes, kayaks, paddle boards to be able to go out the door uh, in rental. Because around here uh, where I live, that's basically anything it, that's basically what people are doing is they're hitting the lakes and the, and the rivers. So uh, we wanted to try to take advantage of that. One thing that uh, we hadn't necessarily had on our priority list, but we do now because it came back from our risk management on campus is the ice machines. And what are we gonna do with ice machines and specifically Legionnaire's disease um, in um, ice machines or other water piping within the facilities that have been shut down for a couple of months. So if you haven't thought about that, that would be something to think about that our risk management guys have brought up and brought back to us uh, as a discussion item. So with that, Pam, um, so, those are my So notes. Chris, you've got one quick question here. Of all your outdoor adventure gear, is there any particular equipment that you didn't, that you chose not to rent out? Any restrictions there? Well, we, our, our primary, primary focus was the watercrafts because we know mm -hmm. that the governor has opened up um, our ability to have watercraft, but we're not mm -hmm. overly concerned right now about camping. Although mm -hmm. our governor is making decisions, you know, we're not seeing necessarily next week this is gonna happen. Some of the decisions have been, hey, tomorrow, um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna release this. So we weren't so concerned about the camping gear because there's so many restrictions that the governor still has in place in our campgrounds. Um, 
and the the huge restriction is you have to have your own uh, toilet basically so mm -hmm. you know you have to have an rv th those mm -hmm. um, bath houses and the campgrounds are not open mm -hmm. and so that's a heavy restriction so we knew that we weren't going to have to get into the camping gear for a little bit yet uh, and our risk managers are making sure that what we're going to use in our laundry service is going to be um, a disinfectant product that will actually kill mm -hmm. Uh, COVID in tents um, and other soft materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there anything else Thank in there you. that you saw? Yeah. Uh, no, I think we're we're good. Um, there's some good people are answering each other's questions. Good, which is great. Thank you for doing that. Um, we have about 10, 12 minutes left, and you know, one of the things I heard you say, Chris, from the experiences of your colleagues around the world is. You know, I think policymakers, government officials, your university leaders are, are, you know, hopefully making the best decisions they can, but no one really knows. This is not an exact science. So I'm curious, um, have you thought through having to reclose, right? It's one thing to have a case, but if your community, your campus, what have you, becomes a hot spot, I know we're all really focused on, on reopening. Are you also <laughs> thinking about if we become a hotspot and have to reclose or what happens if this surges next year? Has anyone um, got some planning around that put together? And, it, and if not, I think the other uh, question that Mark asked in the thread was an important one. How are you thinking about ROI on this, right? Just because we can open or can open under certain restrictions. I know I've heard several campuses say like we could open, but with all the regulations, the protocols, the things we have to do, it's just not practical and maybe it's not affordable. So does anyone wanna share how they're thinking either about just because we can, maybe we shouldn't from a financial or other perspective and then how we're gonna scale up and scale back if needed. We actually were allowed to open May 1st here in Iowa mm -hmm. and we didn't open until yesterday. So we waited several weeks and Community-wide, we did get some kickback and feedback from that mm -hmm. uh, because local private gyms, which are much smaller than us and probably have that duty at a lesser than an in educational institution, uh, were open right away with about, what, 48 hours notice, Iowans, we got. Um, so we did get some kickback on waiting. Uh, but when you talk about being open and staying open, that was one of the conversations that we had almost daily in the time that she announced we could open until we opened yesterday was how do we stay open? So beyond just the outbreak, but what's the supply chain look like for our cleaning supplies? What does the staffing look like if somebody does get sick or if students don't come back to um, the area to work, can we even sustain being open? Mm -hmm. Because if we had opened May 1, I would have not felt comfortable opening and being able to stay open. Um, as everybody who is looking at reopening knows, or is, you know, like, like Rick and I are open, the supply chain for cleaning supplies, for disinfectant, for hand sanitizer, for single-use sanitizing wipes, it's challenging unless you were really smart and got in on it at the beginning of March, uh, your supply chain is going to dwindle and everyone's telling everyone two weeks and that is not, that's not true. So uh, working with our director of facilities and maintenance was crucial to us reopening because I said from day one, when the governor said we could open fitness facilities that we were not going to reopen until I could be assured that our supply chain was valid and that we could stay open because what I really didn't want was to open May 1 and do it halfway and uh, the public relations on that again we ha were held to a higher standard as an educational institution so I wanted to make sure that we were completely prepared and that we weren't going to open May 1 and have to shut down May 10 because we no longer have the supplies available to keep the facility clean and disinfected and safe. So as you're reopening, just, you know, that's something to think about. And I would trust that everyone on a call like this would be thinking about that. But not only do all of us want those cleaning supplies, but 
businesses that maybe never even used those to that extent want them in mass quantities. Um, our, our local hospitals are struggling with you know, different disinfectant supplies and PPE. So if they want them, we're, we're second on the list at best. Mm -hmm. Um, and so our university or our, our college, um, and I think everybody's university will be a little different, but should have a plan in place for what will happen and what are the parameters involved in closing. And because we're located on our campus and we have student employees uh, working most of the hours, we will follow what the campus does. And we that was another reason we didn't open May 1 when fitness facilities were allowed to reopen in Iowa was our campus wasn't open. So we are following exactly what our main campus policies and procedures will include. Hey, hey, yeah, go uh, ahead, Rick. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry to interrupt. I saw a couple questions about climbing walls. How do we yeah. clean that? And to those people for the, the 44 foot indoor climbing facility, our staff are using auto belays and they're going up with a pH neutral disinfectant and spraying all those touch points. For the bouldering wall, they're doing the same thing with a ladder. So that uh, staff are doing that. And Greta, you're right about all those supplies again. Back, uh, like I said, mid-April, we were planning on opening so we started ordering and so we were ahead of some people and some things but mm -hmm. and then our university custodial department is also helping us so they've been probably because they're a big uh, purchaser of those they're still getting a priority and they're sharing with us and other departments uh, so many of those cleaning supplies disinfectants We've also, something that you might want to consider, one of those uh, companies, a commercial company, uh, came in and did some demonstrations, and we're going to buy a couple of those, what do you call it, electrostatic, uh, like handheld, looks like a laser tag gun, mm -hmm. and you mix them the little tablets like you, you might for uh, you, the chlorine, uh, sodium hypo for the pools and it uh, strong disinfectant and you spray it and it's kind of like particles and really covers well so you're not using rags and stuff and all that and it has about a four minute time that you need to allow it to to do its work so I think the that one a backpack we thought about that was closer to three grand uh, I think this one was 1500 and then the supplies. So I know money's tight for everybody, but thought that that's a really good way to cover broader areas than trying to spray with a spray bottle and use yeah. rags or wipes and throwing them away. Just an idea. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Dave, I think Dave Elton was trying to jump in as well. Hey, Pam, I think one of the things logistically to think about is there's a million restaurants that can't use bar rags anymore. There's 50,000 hotels, there's 15,000 health clubs. Just, this is just in the U.S., let alone the global supply chain. Right. And on top of that, a lot of the, I know there's one 300 club uh, hotel chain that bought up a six month supply and pretty much wiped out one supplier of wipes and hand sanitizers. And, and actually the touchless dispensers are harder to find than, than hand sanitizer. So mm -hmm. I call it toilet paper syndrome. You know, we never mm -hmm. thought three, two months ago that toilet paper would be so hard to find. It's not a normal logistical supply chain we're dealing with or competing against a significantly increased demand. And a lot of those facilities are opening way before we're on the tail end. And right. the, tail end and the supply chain's already maxed out and it's just, and it's right. still early. Yeah, thanks Dave. Another suggestion, you know, Iowa, we have a lot of ethanol plants that are moving to a different product. Instead of fuel, they're doing sanitizers. And so that is a resource that we've tapped into here in Northwest Iowa is connecting with our local ethanol plants on getting disinfectant and hand sanitizer from them. So that was a very fruitful phone call. 
Yeah, we just have a few minutes left and there were some questions. Uh, Mike, maybe I'll ask you to jump in about masks versus face shields and, and you're trying to do some research on the, the pros and cons of each. Yeah, um, similar to Chris, we have the same sort of organizational structure from top down related to committees and all that stuff. And one of the committees that I'm on is, is you know, the requirement for mask. And one of the questions out there is, is you know, do face shields supplement or replace the use of mask? And what we're seeing is that it's kind of, you got to look at it from two different frameworks. Face shields protect me where I wear a mask to protect you. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, there's just my research, and I'll give my colleagues over at the University of Iowa a lot of credit. Their medical field have done the research, and they're demonstrating that masks are very, very, excuse me, shields are very preventative. But there's, there's just not enough research out there that shows that it protects the you know, it protects the person versus it protecting me. And so mm -hmm. I'm having a hard time on my campus recommending that we allow for the use of face masks or face shields instead of face masks. And so mm -hmm. that's why I was curious what other people were considering because as, as Chris was mentioning, when we talk about working and trying to be supportive of our, of our participants, face masks, don't allow for good communication. Right. You know, you can't see expressions, you can't, you know, you people, you know, with hard of hearing, so forth and so on. Right. So shields in a lot of ways do that. And, and the biggest complaint out there is people are complaining about using or extended use as a face mask for extended periods of time, mm -hmm. where shields give a lot more protection or a lot more freedom of that such. So that that's just really kind of what I was seeing, what others were thinking about and what their universities are recommending one versus the other where we're here we're probably still going to say that shields are more of a ppe mm -hmm. and should only be used in connection or in conjunction with other uh, products but still only be used within the medical or high uh, risk area so i was just curious what others were thinking yeah. of doing yeah no absolutely who else is thinking about masks versus face shields Stephanie, you had a good question in the chat about mask and goggles, and I hadn't heard of a lot of places requiring goggles, although on a personal note, my mother works at a private physical therapy clinic, and they are now requiring masks mm -hmm. and goggles, um, but they're in their experience in outbreak in their county in Iowa, so I mm -hmm. think that is the reason for it, but that's a good question. Is anybody researching goggles? Pam, uh, Greg Jordan here. Uh, no, I'm not researching goggles, but we got about a minute left. And I do want to just soapbox for a second on your ROI question, because nobody's mm -hmm. really talked about that. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd frame it, how can we afford not to do these things? And we have mm -hmm. to be thinking and challenging our leaders and our resources to find, find them to, to get back to whatever quote the new normal is because the old normal's gone. So quit thinking along those lines mm -hmm. and, and start thinking about what, what it's gonna look like. So in, in the scope of a university operating budget, the dollars we're talking about are minuscule. So we find them. I had a conversation with our head of custodians on campus the other day, campus wide. Well, I don't think we have the resources to clean the restrooms. Well, you better find them you have to find them. Shame on you for not thinking outside the box, because if we don't have them, then there's nobody on campus and we're closing. So mm -hmm. part, part of my uh, soapboxing, but as directors, you know, we ought to be thinking in those terms, too. Of, uh, you know, we're, we're not returning to what we left. And, mm -hmm. and this conversation, I truly, truly value and appreciate everybody on the call and the series of calls that you've had. Thank you very much. Mm hmm. No, good, good points, uh, Greg, you know, I, I, and how do we measure ROI in this new normal, 
right? You know, I know I've been doing that at NURSA, you know, the ways we measured success, even financial success um, are going to change um, because I think the value proposition is shifting. Um, and, you know, it, it's always been a factor of, of time, money, and value. Um, but I think we're seeing that through a different lens now. And, and I think you'll see a similar thing with, with your patrons and your students and your, your community members. Um, and yeah, Greg, I, I'm, I'm glad you're finding value in this. I'm glad all of you are finding value in this. You continue to show up because it is the power of your conversations and connections um, that gives us all the confidence that we will figure this out. We will come out the other side. Um, we will um, do this well, um, even if we have a bad day here or there, but we will ultimately um, come out the other side thriving. I, I do really, really believe that. So. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, Greta, Rick, and Chris uh, for being panelists, um, especially Rick and Greta, who I just called yesterday and said, hey, <laughs> would you like to talk about reopening 24 hours later? Um, so they are great colleagues, as most of you know. Thank you for that. And Chris, thank you for helping me think through, you know, what directors wanted to talk about today. I, I really appreciate that. So we'll continue to have these as long as you find value in them. Um, keep an eye on, on the Ideas in Motion page. Um, over the next couple weeks, uh, we have been reaching out to a lot of our higher ed partners. So I mentioned Ermia, there's other ones coming up. So if you'd find value in hearing from um, professionals on campus outside of campus recreation, keep an eye on those because um, we'll be rolling those out over the next couple weeks. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your week.